Well, good morning, everyone. We have a, a, kind of an interesting panel for you today. We're going to talk a little about the uh, Exxon Valdez spill. It's been 30 years. It, there's a lot to uh, learn about where we are at, and a lot of generation, uh, younger generations really haven't seen what the harm is. So our hope for you today is to start out making sure that um, everyone understands the harm of the spill, and by the end of the day in the later sessions, we'll understand uh, what we're doing different now and, and how we're preventing spills. Uh, so there's a lot to learn today on EVOS and a lot of things going on, but Patricia is going to again lead us in a, a conversation about the spill with some of the um, folks who were there. So thank you all. Patricia. These are on. Do you want both of them? Yeah. No, I, I'm mic so we're good. Okay, she's mic and you guys I'm can Mike, share so. this when it comes time. <laughs> you just get to hang on to that. <laughs> okay, let's everybody get, get comfortable here first. Uh, so thanks everybody for uh, for joining us at the forum this morning. You know, 30 years later, it's still hard to uh, hard to watch that film, isn't it? Yeah, I think for all of us who lived it uh, and uh, have lived with the consequences of uh, the spill, it's um, it's still pretty near to our hearts. So uh, anyhow, good morning, everybody at, at uh, all of my Alaska Forum family. I'm very happy to see all of you here today. And uh, happy Valentine's Day to everyone. So this is a day for us to remember to do an act of kindness. Uh, remember all the people that we love. Give a hug to people who need it. Pay it forward. So today is a good, a good reminder for all of us to, to, li to live in the way we, uh, we choose. So we've got uh, a kind of limited time today. We've got so many people on the panel, all of uh, friends that I've known for, for many, many years. And it's really nice to, to see all of your faces here today. Um, I think I, most people know that my name is Patricia Cochran. I'm from, um, from Nome, born and raised in Nome. Um, my experience with EVOS was that I was uh, Director of Employment and Training for Chugachmute. Uh, so that's where RJ and I and patients uh, know each other from a while back. <laughs> uh, so I know the sound pretty well. I walked all of the beaches there. Uh, I was also very lucky to be the planner for uh, the village of New Chinega when they moved. So I really got to know Prince William Sound how to see kayak there. Growing up on the shores of Bering Sea, I didn't, didn't really get into, into that too much, but learned to love Prince William Sound. So it was really hard for, for us to see what happened there. Um, just a, a, a quick outline of what we're going to be doing this morning. Again, we've, we've, because we've got a short period of time, what I'm going to do is, is to read the bios, a very brief bio from each of the uh, presenters here because we unfortunately have only about five minutes <laughs> for each of them to tell their story about what they experienced, uh, what they wanted to share about, uh, about the uh, oil spill. And hopefully at the end we're going to have time for a, a few uh, wrap-up comments. Um, and uh, each of you, you, you please feel free to use the microphone and sit where you are if you want to do that, or if you'd like to come up to the podium, feel free to do that as well. So just be comfortable, relax. This is, this is all our family here. So um, let me first introduce my amazing and beautiful elder, uh, Patience Anderson Faulkner. Uh, Patience has a BA in Justice with a minor in Sociology a paralegal certificate in general law, and a legal technician certificate in federal Indian law. In addition to teaching classes in native crafts and subsistence practices, she's a founding member of the Oil Regions of Alaska Foundation and the local emergency response team. She represents the Cordova Fishermen's uh, District Fishermen United on Prince William Sound, a regional citizen advisory council and subsistence inter interests on the EVOS Public Advisory Council. She also serves on several boards, including the native village of EAC, uh, Cordova Public Library, and Cordova Electric Cooperative. Thank you, Patience, for joining us today. My other uh, good friend, RJ, RJ Kopchak. RJ arrived in Alaska in 1974. Wave your hand there so people know who you are, RJ. <laughs> um, 
Prince William Sound and its sustainable fisheries have been home ever since for him. He runs boats, explored or commercial fish the entire mainland coast of Alaska from the Beaufort Sea to the Inside Passage. He's active in fisheries politics, policy and conservation since his arrival. He's served on the boards of the Cordova District Fishermen United, United Fishermen of Alaska, Copper River Fishermen's Cooperative, the Oil Spill Recovery Institute, and the City Council. He's also testified before Congress and contributed language for federal and state legislation. He was a founding president of the Prince William Sound Science Center and chairman of the Herring Recovery Planning Team for EVOS uh, Trustee Council. Uh, David Parrish, David. There's David at the end there. David has been involved in public policy in energy and mining in Alaska for over 30 years, while also lobbying for programs addressing disabilities, child abuse, teen suicide, and youth tobacco and marijuana prevention. Kayaking in Prince William Sound was one of the reasons why he moved to Alaska in 1986. David joined Exxon six months before the Valdez spill which thrust him into the front pages as a company spokesman. He worked for them through 2006. His new book, The Facts of the Matter, Looking Past Today's Rhetoric on the Environment and Responsible Development, is an Amazon number one bestseller. Woohoo! He has also contributed columns to The Hill and to the Anchorage Daily, Daily News. My friend Pamela Bergman, Pamela, uh, before she retired, Pam served with the U.S. Department of Interior for 28 years. During that time, she held a leadership role in oil spill preparedness and response. Her accomplishments included leading efforts that established oil spill guidelines in Alaska for oiled wildlife, historic properties rep protection, and potential places of refuge for distressed vessels. After the uh, 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill, Pamela served on, as the Department of Interior on-scene representative during the initial weeks of the response and as the Interior representative for the remaining three-year response effort. She was also the Interior, Interior Restoration Team representative following the establishment of the EVO Spill Council. Other spill experience include the uh, 2004 Selendang IU grounding in Alaska and the 2010 Deepwater Horizon spill. Jim Fall, there's Jim. Jim is the statewide program manager research director for the Division of Subsistence of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game based in Anchorage. He holds degrees in cultural anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is the author or co-author of dozens of technical papers that describe subsistence harvests and use of fish and wildlife resources in Alaska. He was a member of the EVOS uh, Health Task Force and was principal investigator for several projects that reached the effects, researched the effects of uh, oil spill on subsistence harvests and users. uses. Uh, Stanley or Jeep Rice. Jeep retired from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Auk Bay Lab, after 42 years leading an oil effects group that studied oil toxicity issues relevant to Alaska and the Exxon Valdez spill. They conducted studies involving herring, whales, lingering oil, fish embryos, and the long-term effects and persistence of oil, publishing many papers. Since retirement, Jim Jeep continues to participate in the Gulf Watch and the Herring programs. After retiring for the Department of Justice as an expert witness in their case against BP for the 2010 Gulf spill, there he reviewed Gulf spill studies and realized the most relevant literature was often from the Exxon Valdez. The unique value of these studies was significant it changed the intensity and the quality of how oil spill science is conducted. So these are our panelists this morning and we thank you all for joining us today. So I'm going to uh, start with patience and uh, ask 
each of you to uh, try to keep your talks to maybe around five minutes or so. And to, the question to you is just based on your experience. Um, how, how did the Exxon Valdez oil spill affect you, your community? Well, uh, thank you. And thank everyone for being here. Um, while I was preparing mentally to come here, I went, you know, the first liar does not have a chance. So you guys will have to measure up to me. Um, I, I'm, I'm from Cordova, and I ended up being very fortunate during the Exxon Valdez initial year working in two places. One was with Vico, the cleanup company, and the second was with the class action attorneys. Both of them had dynamic experiences, and <clears throat> the one thing great in common happened to be Individuals that were involved in the spill, physically working, needed someone to talk to. And most of them would say, you know, I'm not allowed to talk about this because I could get fired. And so they were keeping a lot of this emotion of um, seeing the oil, picking it up, looking at the devastation and the, and the undaunting challenge before them. And they had no place in which to um, download a little. I was in a place where, okay, you can tell me, I'll keep it confidential, and they started telling me stories of what they were going through. It was very, very frustrating. Later on, after the BICO cleanup experience that I worked with, with people, I went to work with the class action attorneys. I had the same thing. The fishermen, the cannery workers, the businesses, all came to me. I guess I had a good listening ear and would tell me their, what they were going through, their emotions, their frustrations. Um, from that experience, I, I begged the attorneys. I said, we need some mental health help here, desperately. We are all on the ragged edge, and we need some help. Through that, Prince William Sound Regional Citizens Advisory Council put together a peer listening program with Dr. Pakou, who was doing the social impact. So from all of that experience, I got to listen to stories of how this bill devastated people. Um, what I ended up doing was trying to encourage people to look deep within themselves, to find that hidden talent, that resilience, and bring that forth and work with that. Many people, I had to keep encouraging, many people brought that forth and it has made our communities stronger, more sensitive, and we're kind of active. So. Thank you. Thank you, Patience. And now we'll have uh, Jeep. Well, my uh, perspective is uh, fundamentally different as a scientist and not a resident of the sound or directly impacted by, by the activities that uh, followed. Uh, and my message really is similar to what I said there in the film that we just saw, that, uh, that before the spill, science uh, in studying the spills was dramatically different than what has happened since after the spill. Prior to the spill studies, uh, oil, oil spills are tragedies, but they're kind of one-time events, so to speak. Uh, a big rush to clean up the oil, collect any dead carcasses, and get rid of any evidence of oil, so to speak. And very few follow-up studies, virtually none, uh, would follow many of the studies prior to Exxon Valdez. So the effects were thought to be relatively short-term, one-time events, and transient, and not having a long-lasting impact. With Exxon Valdez, that changed. Everything has changed after that. The studies are more intense. It happened in a pristine area. In contrast to what Craig Tillery said there in the film, there are a couple of, of baseline studies. There's one chemical baseline study. There's a baseline study, for example, with those killer whales where you saw the populations decline and recovery was poor in one and not existent in the other. So these baselines that were there uh, were very important. Uh, the, another study that, uh, the killer whale study is very unique and it showed 
a long-term effect from a very short-term exposure. The exposures they got was probably coming up and breathing in that oil slick, but yet because of their low pr reproductive rate, uh, the inhalation damage probably led to pneumonia or some other t sorts of diseases, and they kind of disappeared from the population to only be detected a year and two years and three years later. With the uh, photographic ev evidence that Craig Macklin was uh, doing, so very good study, excellent study, showed this long-term effect. The other study that uh, that was very unique was the pink salmon study done first by ADF and G that found elevated embryo mortalities in pink salmon in the oiled intertidal oil streams in Western Prince William Sound. That was a unique event. What was even more unique is that when they went back in the second year, 1989, you could almost expect that because there's oil everywhere sloshing around. But by 1990 and 91 and 2, uh, not very much visible evidence of oil, and yet they still found elevated and real mortalities uh, in those oiled streams. It declined with time, okay, but uh, was still, uh, that, that was a very unique, dramatic, important, scientific observation. Our laboratory then took on some laboratory type studies, ex toxicity exposure studies, led by Ron Heinz and done in a hatchery in Little Port Walter, where we exposed literally tens of thousands of embryos to varying doses of, of oil and found that instead of getting toxicity or sensitivity levels at the parts per million level, we could get it at the parts per billion level. And parts per billion is three orders of magnitude different from a part per million. So this lowered the toxicity level, that uh, fraction that, that could potentially harm animals, okay? The more sophisticated studies that developed in succeeding years showed that if we had a, uh, an exposure of as low as five parts per billion of the polycyclic aromatics, the toxic fraction of oil, we could get a 20% decrease in returning adults. These are from animals that were uh, where the embryos exposed and the fry as they came out of the gravels were tagged uh, with a wire tag in their nose so they could be identified and separated out of what dose group they came from uh, a year and a half later when they returned as adults and the, and the returns are that much down. This is a huge finding. And when I say this sort of science changed uh, oil spill science, so then move ahead to the 2010 oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, the embryos were a very huge target study, and even more elegant experiments were done down there by those researchers who looked at uh, parts per billion impacts on embryos. They found, for example, a low parts per billion would affect heart rates uh, in embryos developing, where a heart rate would be kind of like this, and then if it was oil exposed, the heart rate was depressed and a little bit more disorganized, and yet the animal's alive, so if you're looking at the, in the way we did things prior to the Exxon Valdez, live or dead, that animal that had the really slow heartbeat would be counted as alive, and yet it had no chance of survival and didn't and wouldn't. I guess collectively, let me just talk very briefly about the sea otters and the oil persistence studies. Uh, sea otters were studied, like all species, in a very species-specific, centric sort of way. And in one group, uh, Balachi and Botkin were finding one group of sea otters were not recovering at the normal rate that others in the Prince William Sound were recovering uh, in this one area of uh, uh, near Herring Bay and a little bit on around the corner. And uh, they followed that group uh, literally for more than two decades and had no recovery of that group. And then independent of that, at the 10-year anniversary, we knew there was oil in Prince William Sound uh, seen by people digging those pits occasionally. Dave Jenka, for example, from Cordova would do that every year, go out and find more oil, and has documented it ever since. Well, then we had, that stimulated a, a very robust scientific study led by Mandy Lindeberg, you saw her in the film, went out to over 100 different beaches uh, that were oiled in 1989, dug pits in a very systematic grid-like uh, fashion, and found oil in over half of those beaches. And the remarkable thing about finding that oil, it was still intact, still had vapors, 
that you could smell, meaning the toxic fractions were still there. It was liquid. It was still uh, going to be toxic if it was exposed. When we overlaid the two studies, her study and the sea otter study, guess what? They overlap very well. Where the impacts were uh, on the otters, there was still persistent oil. And their sophisticated studies then used radio tracking and devices implanted in them to determine what depths they were diving to. The females with little, little babies who they would not want to leave on the surface for very long would dive the shallowest depths. And this meant that they were diving, and they could document it, diving in areas that were covered at high tide over the lower intertidal zone where Mandy and the field of biologists were finding oil. So we could document that the depths were corresponded to what the otters were. So again, this is a very remarkable and, and game-changing uh, uh, scientific study. Collectively, uh, all these studies, plus the others I haven't mentioned, the hundreds of others, they documented the, the change, the long-term effects of, of oil uh, and the long-term damages. So with that, I'll, I'll end. Thanks. We'll move to uh, RJ. Thanks, and thanks, Jeep. So this is pretty tough to follow patients in Jeep and the movie because these, uh, pretty much a lot has been covered. I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a perspective on, on, the, on the social and commercial fisheries impacts of this bill. And, and forgive me for reading, but I don't normally do that, but I didn't want to miss a couple of points, so excuse me. So on March 24, 1989, when the, when the tanker grounded, she carried about 1.2 million barrels of oil, 265,000 barrels spilled about, and they spread with the currents throughout the sound. 3,000 miles is my guess, the coastline was, uh, was oiled because these are intricate coastlines. You can't stretch them. If you stretch them out, it's a lot of miles. And uh, the oil spill went from Bly Reef to Kodiak Island, and uh, it killed hundreds of thousands of birds, thousands of marine mammals, countless other marine life. The chaos of the event was almost impossible to comprehend, and I did 11 months in Vietnam. And I'm going to tell you right now that the chaos of the event following this bill was equal to any of the crazy situations that I saw there. The, the manifestation of, of damages to just the human psyche from the exposure to, to the devastation was phenomenal. Um, after 30 years, um, it still continues to impact both the ecosystem and the social system in Prince William Sound. It's especially, I think, tough on the tribal communities. I think that they saw some of the greatest impacts because of their loss of access to subsistence um, systems. Well, when a natural system is poisoned to the magnitude that occurred after the Exxon Valdez, the system fundamentally changes. The relationship between predator and prey, the availability of, of a of productive spawning and rearing habitat, shifts in microchemistry that affect developing embryos and future generations. Whole generations of some populations of birds, mammals, fish, shrimp, and shellfish can be lost, and some of those populations were. The reduced numbers that uh, affect recovery to, to, to pre-spill levels it can take decades, and in the sense of herring, still, it's 30 years, and, and uh, we're still seeing incredibly depressed population. The spill, of course, coincided with spring, and that was when our herring were about to spawn. Eggs were laid on oil beaches. The emerging larva drifted with the chemical soup that was the result of the spill and dispersants. Um, Jeep mentioned the studies that uh, revealed that fish eggs and developing embryos and larvae can be damaged at exposures at parts per billion. That's incredibly small. And if you, you think of that exposure affecting the chemistry of an egg, you have to think of genetic changes that, that can affect a, an ability of, of a subsequent genera generation to, to deal with impacts that could be disease or, or other stresses. Well, herring mortality skyrocketed over the next four years. And it's funny, when the herring that were supposed to be recruited into the fishery were due, that was three and four years after the spill, they were basically absent. It was fairly obvious that, uh, to the fishing community that, that that impact had taken out that important quantity um, that, that should have been back to, to spawn starting in the, in the early 90s. Um, and so herring fishermen still aren't fishing. So let me give you a little perspective on that herring fishery because these are, these are families. And by the way, these impacts are re repeated in, in other fisheries and, and, and downstream. But in Cordova, in our area, there are over 1,100 people 
participated directly in the herring fishery. They were small and mid-sized family businesses. The vessels were small, two to five crewmen. We harvested herring eggs on kelp. That means you harvested kelp that were covered with herring eggs for the Japanese market. Some of us pounded. That means we hung beautiful kelp we imported from southeast in cages. And we would put herring, catch herring, put them in the cage, let them spawn on that kelp, then let the herring go, sell that, cape, cape, uh, that uh, kelp to the Japanese. And then there was the herring seine and gillnet fisheries. They were targeted on fish eggs. Well, it all went away. So in addition to the 500 herring harvest permit owners uh, operating about 300 vessels, there were about 40 spotter pilots and about 300 other people who picked kelp by hand and harvested, uh, harvested that way for the fishery. The fish processors, they employed about another 200 in shoreside jobs, um, and so that fishery was quite extensive. The value of the herring permits in 1989, owned by commercial fisher fishermen, was about $34 million in permit value. Today, those permits are worth nothing, zero. So you can own a couple of permits, but there's no equity. Um, recently, an economic, an economic profile was done of the impacts. It's compared the Prince William Sound herring fishery to the Sitka Sound herring fishery. They'd run fairly parallel in productivity over, over the years preceding the spill. Well, that analysis showed that um, there's been a loss indicator of about 395 to 438 million dollars directly to the fishing fishing boats and fishing community. The total impacts of, of that on harvest, the primary production, the processing, the distribution and sale is estimated to be between 821 to 995 million dollars since the spill. My family represented uh, pretty much those involved in the, in the fishery. We own two herring permits whose value was $145,000. The equipment we own to harvest, process, and, and uh, deal with those herring was valued at about $50,000. I wasn't a highliner, so my family made about $30,000 a year out of our effort. But if you count it up over 25 years, that's $750,000 in lost revenue. If you put that on top of the lost uh, value of permits and equipment, we're at about $945 million over the last 30 years. It's a little bit of money. So in addition to uh, losing the herring fishery, we, we lost our fishermen-owned cooperative, our fishing co-op. Why did that happen? Well, the co-op was owned by about 135 of us. We depended on the banks for pack financing. That's the money we needed to buy the fish, process the fish, hold the fish, and then market the fish. With the interruption caused by the uh, Exxon Valdez spill, we lost our bank financing. With the reduced harvest that year, we lost the volume that we needed to maintain. And so we lost, the fishermen involved lost another $3 million in their equity in that business. Um, bankruptcies, personal bankruptcies and divorces were incredibly common during this time um, because lots of folks were leveraged to the extent possible to be in the fishery. Well, immediately after the spill and before Exxon began their serious efforts to recover the spilled oil, members of the Copper River Fishermen's Co-op collected over 6,000 gallons of oil by hand filling 1,350 kelp buckets, hand dipping them into oil. And we also poured them into fish totes, about nine fish totes worth. The fishermen were all volunteers. We were all displaced from the herring fishery. The buckets and totes should have been going south filled with, uh, with processed herring and, and herring product. Instead, they were full of hazardous waste. We, we invoiced Exxon. They refused to pay our $9,000 bill, which would have covered the totes and the kelp buckets only, no labor. The state and federal government paid $30 million to reimburse Exxon for uh, money they spent on this bill. The bill was paid using money that Exxon paid the state and federal governments for um, their criminal settlement. Kind of an interesting circle of accountability there. Um, so we used to wake up from the winter about Mid-April, now we don't wake up until May. Our six-month economic opportunity is now down to about four and a half months. And the major economic driver of herring is just absent from the region. And yes, other factors continue to keep populations depressed. Big oil spills change the way systems work, both the social systems and the ecosystems. And that system has been fundamentally changed. Well, fishermen are gamblers. We we're creatures born of hope and optimism, as you know, any fisherman, that's the story of our name. We placed all our bets in unpolluted things, and things got polluted. 
For over 100 years, we managed that fishery on a sustainable basis, and without sustainable fisheries, we're screwed. For the tribal communities, this has been even more devastating over time. The social consequences from the loss of traditional subsistence hunting and gathering opportunities continues to impact those communities along with the commercial fishing crowd. So thank you all for your time. That's my take on this bill. Thanks, RJ. Thank you, RJ. Pamela. Okay, thank you, Patricia, and thank you all for coming to hear our stories this morning. Um, the Exxon Valdez oil spill was a seminal event for me. For many years afterwards, I thought of my life as before and after the Exxon uh, the, the, uh, spill. The morning of the spill, my phone rang at 5 o'clock, waking me up. It was my boss who said, I quote, it's the big one. I instinctively knew what it meant and then said, should I pack before I come to the office? And he said, yes. I just returned from Dutch Harbor the previous week, helping Fish and Wildlife Service deal with oil birds that were a consequence of the grounding of a Japanese freighter. While that experience was valuable, nothing could prepare me for the magnitude of this spill or the response, which consumed my life for the next three years. I headed to Valdez at noon on day one in a Fish and Wildlife Service van accompanied by the Fish and Wildlife Service and Department of Fish and Game representatives. Along the way, we were reviewing the wildlife response, dispersant, and in situ burning guidelines, which had only very recently been approved by the Alaska Regional Response Team. When I went to the Valdez Coast Guard office that night, I was met by the federal on-scene uh, coordinator. I remember us having a laugh when I said, this is a heck of a realistic oil spill exercise. I then spent the next month working out of the Coast Guard command post in Valdez, working 20 hours, or 20 hours a day, seven days a week, before I returned to Anchorage to take a short break. On day two, after receiving reports of oiled sea otters, I tracked down the Exxon representative and strongly recommended that they get someone to Valdez as quickly as possible to develop a plan for dealing with the oiled otters. His response was, a deer in the headlights look. I then showed him our wildlife protection guidelines, which talked about what to do with oiled otters and included a list of experts. I asked him if he wanted me to track down Dr. Randall Davis, who was working in San Diego. He said, yes, I did, even on a Saturday. And when I got Dr. Davis on the phone, I handed the phone over to the Exxon representative, who immediately put Dr. Davis under contract. So thus, the first ever oiled sea otter rescue program was begun. Unfortunately, over an estimated 2,800 oiled, oiled sea otters die as a result of the spill. And to put that in perspective, that is larger than the total population of sea otters along the coast of California in the lower 48. On day three, I flew with the Coast Guard over the spill. I saw the Exxon Valdez moored um, off Naked Island, and I saw a C-130 aircraft spraying dispersants as part of a test. The C-130 looked like a pinhead in a monstrous sea. It was very clear to me at that moment that there were insufficient response resources to recover, disperse, or burn this incredibly large oil spill. On a personal level, it was heartbreaking. I was afraid that Prince William Sound would never be the same again in my lifetime. Valdez was overwhelmed with responders and press. The airport went from seven planes departing and landing every day to over 700. Lodging was at a premium. I had rented a small room in the Valdez Westmark with two full-size beds. I shared the room with female agency responders. The record number in our room was eight women and one very large dog. <laughs> During a later visit, I slept on the floor of a laundry room in an apartment that was rented by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Agency responders were bombarded by the press. In the early days of the spill, the federal on-scene coordinator was doing daily press conferences, 
After his remarks and questions, I took the stage to talk about the impacts on birds and otters. In one press conference, I mentioned that I had in my possession the first oiled bird carcass. I was subsequently hounded by a member of the press until I arranged for him to stage a photo of that bird carcass. Little did we know at the time that there would be over one quarter of a million seabirds killed by the spill. With a new U.S. president in office on January 21st, representatives in the new administration were just getting up to speed on their roles and responsibilities. In one meeting I attended, the brand new Environmental Protection Agency administrator assumed that the Environmental Protection Agency had a lead response role in the spill, which they did not. Fortunately, however, in contrast to the Deepwater Horizon response, except for the Coast Guard, which brought in admirals from the lower 48. Alaska-based agency responders served in the same role as they had before the spill. This was very important. It was a tight-knit group who worked well together, who respected each other's roles and responsibilities, and who knew Alaska. As tough as it was, I personally believe that agency responders did a pretty amazing job given the enormity and the complexity of the hand that we were dealt. Thanks, Pamela. Um, now we're gonna move to Jim. Thanks, I'd, I'd like to start out by just acknowledging that we're meeting in the Denina Convention Center and that we are indeed in the Denina Ashnana, the Denina homeland. I'd like to thank the Denina for caring for this land, Jean Ann. In uh, March 1989, I was the regional program manager for the Division of Subsistence of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Uh, the division is charged under state law with conducting research on all aspects of subsistence hunting and fishing in the lives of Alaska residents and reporting and applying the results of that research. And I, I've never viewed the spill in purely personal terms because I've never lived in a spill community. So when I think back on my experiences, I think about how it affected the work of the division that I work for. And to summarize all this in five minutes, I'll boil it down to three basic or simple, really simple, what I call lessons that I think I'd already learned on the job, but were really highlighted by the experience of being involved in the spill response. Uh, the first basic lesson is be prepared. Uh, the division had conducted comprehensive research in almost all the spill area communities. We had detailed information about species harvested, about quantities of resources harvested, about local use areas to use as a baseline. This helped to measure spill impacts in recovery and inform restoration efforts. Uh, for example, we learned in the year after the spill, subsistence harvest declined in spill area communities from 14 to 77 percent compared to pre-spill averages. The diversity of resources declined and many of the traditional harvest areas were avoided. We also learned that the primary reason for this decline initially was uncertainty about, uncertainty about the safety of eating subsistence foods from the areas affected by the spill. But to address that concern, we really weren't prepared in part because we had never worked directly on issues of resource contamination and risk communication. Which leads me to my second lesson, which is seek and develop partnerships. Our work is collaborative. It's based upon working with local communities. We had developed good relationships with these communities, mostly through the regulatory process and through traveling to communities to understand their way of life. And these established partnerships were essential to collecting and sharing information. But we also needed new partnerships to address this key issue of subsistence food safety. And here the key role was played by the Oil Spill Health Task Force, which was an ad hoc body of mostly federal and state agencies and Alaska Native organizations, which was formed to coordinate the response to subsistence food safety concerns. The task force was led by the Indian Health Service with key roles played by NOAA 
and by the state's Office of Epidemiology. The work of the task force broke new ground, and we learned right off the bat that very little information was actually available about subsistence food safety and oil spills. The task force coordinated a plan to collect and test subsistence foods, develop advice, and communicate findings to the affected communities through meetings and through health bulletins. And the history of our work and partnerships, especially with local communities, led to the th third basic lesson, which is watch your back or never let down your guard. The Alaska Native class filed suit against Exxon, asserting damages to their subsistence way of life. Much of their case drew upon our research, and our staff were called as expert witnesses by the Native class. Of course, as a defendant in the lawsuit, Exxon appropriately sought to review our research findings. And we had some preparation regarding critical review or even skepticism of our work through our experiences with regulatory boards. It's not always fun. But the post-EVOS litigation environment really kicked this challenge to our credibility to a new level. Many of our staff were deposed and I, for example, endured a four and a half day deposition, which is perhaps my most vivid memory of the oil spill experience, and one full day on the witness stand, during which defense attorneys tried very hard to discredit our research findings. And they argued that out of self-interest, respondents were not telling us the truth, and that they um, tried to get us to agree or consent that subsistence was really unimportant or disappearing in these communities. Well, they failed. And while not entirely satisfactory, the Alaska Native class and Exxon did reach a settlement agreement regarding the loss of subsistence harvest. So for me, this aspect of the experience emphasized the need to choose one's words carefully, and it underscores the key importance of quality, transparent, scientific research covered with openness, listening to people, and providing a voice for communities. Uh, so to wrap up my five minutes, <clears throat> these experiences early in the EVOS event and then over the last 30 years um, since those, the division has continued to be involved in assessing spill effects and recovery, mostly in the context Try another one. Okay. And our work is No. Yeah. How about now? Oh, okay. Let's get it close. Well, we've done this work uh, to help assess the progress toward the recovery goal for subsistence that the trustee council has established. We've done several more rounds of um, of interviews in communities and produced several major reports. And if you want to know generally what we've learned, it's best just to go to their reports. But I should note that over time, in a total environment of change, it becomes increasingly difficult to factor out the persistent EVOS effects from other environmental, economic, and socioeconomic changes that affect communities. There was certainly post-spill rebounding of subsistence harvests Concerns about contamination diminished, but did never entirely disappear. And people have reported um, past and continuing disruptions of the transmission of skills and values across generations. But perhaps most importantly, we have concluded that subsistence fishing, hunting, and gathering remain an essential part of the strategy for a resilient, sustainable communities in the spill area. So it's a to conclude, there are these basic, simple lessons. Be prepared, develop partnerships, watch your back. And those are what came to mind when I thought about my, my spill experience, especially early on. Um, and it's really, I think sometimes these basic lessons are the most essential, and they're really the ones that we need to be reminded of. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Now we have David. <laughs> 
Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, gosh, this conversation and even looking out the window here at the office that I, I can see the office building that I worked at in uh, March of 1989 uh, brings back some brings back some memories for me. Um, and particularly, gosh, talk about needing a hug. Um, I had some, some people ask me the, uh, about this panel today. They looked at the at the uh, panel makeup and said, "Gosh, that panel's really stacked." Um, it took me back to 1989 when a lot of people said to me on the side, "Gosh, I'm glad I don't have your job." Um, it, it was a challenging time, and looking at the at, at the window at the office that that I worked at. Um, I remember the threatening phone calls that came in to our administrative staff. Uh, I remember the packages that came in the mail, including to my home. And um, that's why I appreciate this panel is that when we have challenges related to the, the betterment of mankind, technology, science, energy, education, our greatest challenges are solved by people of diverse views sitting together around the table, throwing ideas around rather than throwing rocks at each other. And that takes me to a question I've asked myself a lot over the last few months. How does somebody whose bio on Amazon says they're an energy and mining industry insider write a book that becomes an Amazon bestseller in conservation, green business, environmentalism, uh, and energy policy? and Part of that, what, what I found is looking at some of the other books that are out there in the same categories, uh, there's one that's titled, This is the Way the World Ends. And if we go back to 1989 and think about a lot of the dynamic, um, you know, the, I think as we've heard in the panel today, we all encountered some, some things that um, on a personal emotional level, we never expected, we weren't prepared for. And if we take a worst case approach to that, we could have all thrown our hands up. We've heard e each of us, I think, a story here this morning where it would have been easier to throw our hands up and quit and get on rather than the people coming on the airplanes into Valdez and Cordova to lend a hand in some way to help deal with the, with the events of, of, uh, of the oil spill. Could have left. But instead, people stayed, pitched in, people of diverse viewpoints did their best to work together to address uh, uh, one of the greatest challenges on many levels uh, uh, that uh, uh, is imaginable. And so I think uh, for me, looking back to 1989, the, one of the stories this morning uh, brought me back to, I think, what was, what was, in my view, the low point. And the low point was several weeks after the oil spill when a group of scientists from various state, federal agencies, third parties, were, uh, were gathered to talk about particularly dealing with the response uh, uh, in terms of oiled bald eagles. And the commissioner of the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation came in with a trash bag and a dead bald eagle that had been oiled and it held it up for the TV cameras. And it made for great headlines, um, certainly made the point, but to me the point, the real point of that, con of that meeting was people of diverse viewpoints sitting down trying to deal with, okay, we know this has happened. What do we do? How do we respond? How do we deal with this rather than, uh, than posing for the headlines? Um, on, on the human side of the story, um, it's a very human story that I think never, never, never told. Um, talking about the, the, uh, the Westmark Valdez, March 1989, and all the people sharing hotel rooms and whatnot, story that's often uh, not told is the president of Exxon Shipping Company, who I took to the Valdez Civic Center in, uh, in a room very similar to this, a very challenging situation, and he went back to his hotel room and closed the door, sat on the toilet, and cried. That's a story not told in the press or in the headlines, but gets back to needing a hug in this kind of a situation. Um, the, I took the president of Exxon USA and we went to the village of Tetitlik on day three or four and he went and visited with folks in the school gym and sat and listened to each and every uh, question and concern, did his best to answer what he knew and what he didn't know. Um, didn't bring along a TV cameras, didn't, uh, uh, wasn't posing for the press, but 
trying to have some real conversations. And I think um, in you know, looking back at this scenario of 1989, what have we learned since then, particularly around the science that was discussed today, advancing, um, moving forward? The, the, most, the most challenging uh, questions we face are what, whether it be climate change, technology, education, healthcare, those are solved by listening. Those are solved by listening to people of diverse viewpoints sitting around the room in a spirit of collaboration. And I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, just had some public hearings here in Alaska within the last week on a, um, on, on a major uh, question of energy policy. And the presenters, I think, from the federal agencies were never able to actually make their presentation because protesters shouted them down. Now, how can we have a reasoned conversation around fact, science, um, and process if we shout down those who have differing viewpoints from ourselves. Um, so appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, as, as, as I look back in 1989 to today and some of the stories told in the film, um, you know, and we all, we all are carrying around these uh, smartphones and so the Alaska Forum has an app so I'm able to look and see how many panels are going on, who's there, um, what the speakers are and whatnot. If I have the right barcode, I'm able to follow the hashtags and all that. These things are all made of energy and minerals. There are two billion people around the globe who have the opportunity to move out of poverty in our lifetime. And guess what? They want what we have. They want health care. They want technology. They want mobility and transportation. They want these that are made of minerals and plastics. And I think one of the biggest questions we face is how do we supply those needs? How do we address those questions? Doing so in the most environmentally responsible fashion because uh, the rest of the world isn't going to sit around and, and wait for us. And um, so appreciate the panel today. And again, um, to me, part of the answer coming out of this exercise is people of diverse viewpoints uh, sitting around the table collaborating, throwing ideas around rather than throwing rocks. So thank you. Thank you, David, and thanks to all of our, our panel. I, I know we're getting close to our, our wrap-up time, but I want to give uh, you a chance to, if there's anything you feel you didn't get a chance to say, give you a couple of minutes here to, uh, to say anything. Yeah, RJ. Um, just one last quick observation, although I talked about all kinds of impacts, I'd also like to say that there are a tremendous amount of great things that have resulted from the investments made by the trustees and the industry since that spill. And the legacy of the spill is, is two-sided. It's the yin and the yang of a major event. And there are a lot of dark parts to that, but the, the science, the community organization, the response capacities, um, are now better here in this state than anywhere else in the world. And that's a direct legacy of this giant tragedy. So we're moving forward and in a very positive way. And without the EVO science and long-term commitment to monitoring, the next generations won't have the data and information they need to manage a rapidly changing uh, environment. So there are positive ends after this crazy event. Anyone else? We talked, uh, and I listened very extensively, and I know this from my personal history. It was a networking of agencies, which was important, but it was a networking of friends that helped us get through all of this, and it continues to do so. So everyone out there, work with your friends, pay attention to what they're doing, and call on them to help you, because it does help make the world a little better. So thank you very much to the panel. It's been really interesting to hear from the community perspective, from the agency perspective, from the uh, uh, industry perspective. Thank you all very much uh, for being friends, for all of us being uh, stewards of the la this beautiful land that we all live upon. Uh, please uh, join me in giving a, a round of applause and thanks to all of our guests. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, thank you so much. Um, I know everyone just listened, um, as I did, just really for every word. And also in the film, I, I know it wasn't just myself, but it was being thrown back. You're suddenly there again, and you forget how you felt, and, uh, and uh, tears in my eyes for, for what happened. But um, it has been mentioned that you can't go back. This thing did happen, but we have learned so much from it, even though we're still um, suffering and, and some of the, um, some of the animals um, didn't come back and the herring fishery didn't come back. Um, yet I've been to Cordova and Cordova was devastated as many of the other coastal um, places are, but when you go back, you've got people who are working as, as these agency people talked with, with a positive attitude, saying we aren't going to be put to our knees on this. We will rise and we will have a viable community and work to have a viable and rich environment for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren and, and generations beyond. And that's what we all wish for and hope for. Um, it just, I know it touches all of us so deeply. And I just want to thank all of the people who have come and were there and are willing to share their heart. Sometimes we think of agency people as not understanding or feeling or knowing how we feel, but they do. They have the same heart and, and, and they do go back and cry because sometimes the problem seems so big, but together, as it's been pointed out, together, we all networking together. Um, when you see the people up here, their contacts are available on the app and you can call and, and find out from AFE. But what a great organization we have to continue to work for the betterment of our, our communities and the future. So thank you so much. Yes, yes. And we have gifts um, to thank those who come up uh, before us because sometimes in a really difficult situation where something so devastating as this happens, it takes courage to get before us and, and hope we don't throw rocks. <laughs> but we do, we do appreciate so much. And thank you all out here for all of the work you do.